Sometimes ask me if I've always wanted to work on public policy. I tell them no, I didn't grow up thinking I'd become a climate activist. In fact, I always wanted to become a college professor. But our planet had other plans for me. I grew up in the rainforested country of Suriname in South America. When I was a teenager, my family immigrated to the US, and I ended up studying computer science at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida, where I met my new best friend, a junior, Vince, majoring in biochemistry. One night, he explained to me that as we burn fossil fuels, we release extra carbon into the air, which traps more heat from the sun, dangerously changing the Earth's climate. I realized that my new hometown could become a hellscape in just a matter of decades, and I began to take actions to protect our environment, including starting a recycling program, fighting invasive species, and protecting nesting seabirds. In 1992, I joined the graduate program at MIT, where I met my amazing wife, Radhika, and we decided to settle down in Cambridge. Our careers took off, and we were soon able to purchase our own home, drive a nice hybrid car, and comfortably raise our two children Janavi and Sunil. We were living the American dream. By the time I was 35 years old, I'd become the CEO of a biotech startup company. As I had almost no free time available, this armchair environmentalist was limited to signing online petitions with the click of a button. Perhaps some of you are in the same position even now. This is Janavi. When she was eight years old, she asked me the question that jump-started my career as a climate activist. Daddy, what's going to happen with climate change? Are we all going to die? Fielding her question was a major reawakening for me, and I decided that signing a few online petitions was not enough of an answer. So I began reading the latest reports on climate change and I discovered that the crisis had gotten much worse since my freshman year in college. I noticed that average temperatures were continuing to climb, and major weather disasters were happening more often and becoming increasingly destructive. And the evidence pointed directly at our collective burning of coal, oil, and gas. So I joined with other activists in Cambridge to advocate for change. But globally and locally, our emissions have continued to increase and the climate has continued to worsen. In fact, let's see just how bad things have gotten over the last decade. Heat waves and floods have become deadlier. And droughts are worse, as we've seen with the near emptying of many lakes and rivers across the globe. And if we don't take more decisive action soon, we could end up melting so much glacier ice that sea levels could rise several feet this century, dooming millions of people to drowning or displacement. I think you'll agree with me that such an outcome would be totally unacceptable, especially when we have the power today to prevent it. We really can now prevent future disastrous climate impacts by ending our reliance on fossil fuels and switching instead to relying on the power of the sun. Let's see why that's true. Consider the total amount of energy consumed by all 8 billion of us over the course of a single year. It's a huge amount of energy, unimaginable really. And yet, the sun sends more energy to our planet in one day than we need in an entire year. There are at least three ways that we can capture that energy and put it to work. One, concentrate the heat energy we receive from the sun. Two, convert sunlight into electricity using solar panels. 
and three, harvest wind energy, which is caused by the sun heating the air, using wind turbines to turn it into electricity. Fortunately, thanks to a series of important breakthroughs, solar and wind are now the cheapest ways to generate electricity. I kid you not, and I encourage you to do your own checking on this, solar and wind are now cheaper than all fossil fuels. Let's turn our focus now to a more practical question. How hard is it to actually change our lives to start relying fully on the sun? Radhika and I decided to try the experiment on our house in Cambridge. We began by adding extra insulation to the attic and changing our windows with more energy efficient ones. Then we looked at solar, but in 2011, the best panels available only generated 300 watts of power each, which wasn't enough to justify the expense at that time. By 2013, a company called SunPower began making panels that produced 345 watts each. For reference, they're up to 400 watts today, so they do keep improving. We installed 20 of these panels on the west side of our roof, creating a seven kilowatt system to begin reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. And two years later, we installed an identical system on the east roof. Together, they produce about 70% of the energy we consume in one year. We buy the rest as 100% renewable electricity on the grid. We also installed a two panel system in the south facing steeple of our house that heats our water directly from the sun. But at that time, we were still burning fossil gas to heat our home, to dry our clothes and to cook our food. So in 2018, we installed an air source heat pump, which is two to three times more efficient than burning fossil gas. And in the summer of 2020, we replaced the clothes dryer and the gas stove with all electric ones, ending our home's consumption of fossil fuels for good. And we didn't focus only on the house. We also chose more efficient cars. From 2004 to 2016, we drove a Toyota Prius. In 2016, we shifted to the partially electric Chevy Volt. And in 2019, we switched again, this time to the all electric Chevy Bolt. In the process of making these changes, we cut our energy consumption in half while completely eliminating fossil fuel combustion at the house and in our car, saving lots of money along the way. Granted, as homeowners, we could afford to buy our own solar panels, but how can we extend these benefits to less privileged community members? Fortunately, here too, we have solutions readily available. Consider community solar, a brilliant win-win-win that allows investors to profit from a solar installation on a commercial building with most of the electricity sold to low income rate payers at a discount. In 2015, I helped found a startup company that created the first community solar system serving Cambridge. So by 2015, I'd taken steps at home with my family and throughout Cambridge to better align our lifestyle with the growing climate crisis. But my daughter's question was still weighing heavily on me because I understood that without more action at a global scale, what we did in Cambridge wouldn't make much of a difference. In December that year, I attended the UN Conference on Climate Change in Paris as the co-founder of a climate-focused business association. The lead up to Paris was intense because expectations were building that our world would finally agree to a global climate treaty. And we did, but not without some major drama, of course. As we marched in protest through the hangars of Le Bourget Airport, we chanted, 1.5 to stay alive. Our goal, which we successfully achieved, was to include a more stringent limit on the total amount of global warming that the treaty would allow. 
1.5 degrees Celsius. I came home from Paris, hopeful for the first time in decades. But I also realized that to further protect us from climate catastrophe, I would have to do even more. So I ran for local office. In 2017, I was elected to the Cambridge City Council and began to legislate an end to burning fossil fuels. I packaged these policies as a Green New Deal for Cambridge, creating jobs for our residents while transitioning to renewable energy in the city we call the innovation capital of the world. And our inventiveness only begins with more energy efficient solar panels and bigger wind turbines. As of 2022, several groups in both Europe and America were making progress on solar powered green chemistry, including making jet fuel from thin air. And in the fall of 2022, a Dutch company demonstrated the first directly solar powered car. How cool is that? I'm really excited by the sense of possibility these new technologies are creating. And while switching our energy supply to the sun is not all we have to do to stave off climate catastrophe, it is critically important that we take that step together and quickly. So let's explore what you personally can do to take action. As with anything, knowledge is power and getting better informed is usually free. For example, if you don't yet know what it's like to drive an electric vehicle, newsflash, it's pretty cool. Why not schedule a test drive? Go get informed. You can even get a solar assessment for your house over the internet. Once you're better informed, you can pick and choose the actions that make the most sense to you. Next, you can educate and advocate, helping to spread the word of what is possible and affordable today. Finally, if you're so inclined, you can run for local office, changing the laws and aligning the incentives that govern our economy and our energy choices. I'm living proof that we can do this. Together, I know we can create a shared human future that will help ensure Janavi, Sunil, and all our children will inherit an earth they can safely enjoy for many more generations to come. Thank you.